Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, depending on where you are, and welcome to the 10th installment of FNA's uh, Subtech broadcast series. Joining us today are Pertu Korhunen of the Qatar Financial Center Regulatory Authority and Matt Grasser of the Cambridge Subtech Lab. Uh, our discussion will revolve around the complementary capabilities of RegTech on the one hand and Subtech on the other hand. But before we begin, let me provide some quick housekeeping remarks. Um, this broadcast follows a 60 minute format. I'll spend the first 45 minutes talking with uh, Pertu and Matt, and then we'll have a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, next, let me briefly introduce myself and FNA. So my name is Thomas Nilsson, and I am the main uh, point of contact and the functional lead for all subtech solutions at FNA. Uh, and FNA is an advanced analytics and simulation technology company. We work across four core sectors, namely central banks, commercial banks, financial market infrastructures, or FMIs, and national security. So we're very active as a company in the subtech space where we collaborate with central banks and financial supervisory authorities on a multitude of projects. In fact, we just finished a project with the Cambridge Subtech Lab for, a, uh, for the Peruvian uh, Financial Supervisory Authority. Uh, our software is generally tailored for each sector. So where a central bank might use our technology for stress testing uh, of payment systems, a commercial bank might use the same technology to optimize its internal liquidity usage. So we have some algorithms and some methods that we are using generally, but then we tailor them specifically to each uh, sector. But enough about FNA, let's get started. So Pertu and Matt, many in the audience may know you, but uh, for those who don't, I will ask you to briefly introduce yourselves and your work in Subtech. Let's begin with you, Pertu. Take it away. Thanks, Thomas, um, and thanks for having me. <clears throat> so I'm Pertu. Um, I I'm the head of uh, department of uh, financial analysis and innovation at the QFCRA. Um, I have been working at regulators and central banks for now about 20 years. I started from the analytical end, uh, performing uh, offsite analysis for supervisory purposes. But then uh, increasingly, uh, I, I got interested in, in the prospect of transforming the way we actually do it. Um, because the copying and pasting and using Excel and uh, quite clunky methods, uh, frankly, to to collate and analyze the inside just wasn't as I wanted it. And uh, hence the reason why uh, becoming an uh, expert and uh, professional uh, in, in subtech. Thanks so much, Pertu. And uh, Matt, tell us about yourself. Sure, yeah. I'm Matt Grasser. I'm a co-head and co-founder of the Cambridge Soup Tech Lab at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm also the principal uh, technologist at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, which is a research center um, within the Judge Business School at the university. Um, and so we at the Cambridge Soup Tech Lab really focus on um, accelerating the use of technology uh, to support supervisors in effectively and efficiently doing their work to create more equitable and um, secure and sustainable financial ecosystems financial markets. Um, the way that I've kind of gotten into this space is, is a bit circuitous, but um, prior to the lab, I was working with uh, RegTech for Regulators Accelerator as the chief technologist there with uh, my co-head of the lab now, Simone de Castri, um, for a number of years. And uh, the way that I got involved with that originally is through um, financial inclusion. Uh, I was working as a, a technologist and data scientist uh, to support research in financial inclusion, um, acceleration of startups, et cetera. Um, and through that work came to realize uh, that reliability is the number one factor in adoption of inclusive um, financial products uh, for being able to like bring people into the market. And what underpins reliability is effectively uh, in large part supervision and the challenges uh, therein became a, a really strong passion of mine and, and a really fun place, frankly, to play with uh, the tech and, and data science skills that, that our team brings to the table. Sounds good. Well, let's get into it then and talk about these capabilities. Uh, so um, all three of us spoke at the Cambridge Subtech Week back in early December, uh, hosted by the Cambridge Subtech Lab, Lab among others. Um, and we saw that many financial authorities are exploring Subtech solutions. Um, some solutions are perhaps more promising than others. Um, so let me ask you, Pertu, what examples stood out for you during Subtech Week? 
Well, I think, well, thanks, Matt, uh, first of all, for organizing. It was a great week of uh, presentations and discussions, um, indeed. Um, I think I think something we can't avoid uh, talking about are the LLMs. Um, it, it, it just is a fact that large language models have changed the landscape for everyone, and not least for the, um, in terms of the prospects for subtech because of the very high importance of, of management information and all kinds of unstructured documents um, as information sources for, for supervisors. And um, relating to documents, um, all tasks such as um, search of information, summarization of documents, translation, these are forever changed now with, uh, with the LLMs because they just beat any earlier method for for these uh, tasks but <clears throat> in addition i think there's uh, also much more in, in llms than that the, they essentially they promise that the natural language can become the key user interface to any kind of computer system um, the llms can can help us to generate ideas they can turn natural language into a request into a database query or um, a Python piece of Python code. Um, and something that was really fascinating and good to see uh, during the Subtech week was the um, demo by the, by the neighbors, uh, Saudi Central Bank, um, in which um, um, they, they showed how a central banking analyst could um, converse with an LLM, um, first of all, generating analytical um, questions that are relevant to the domain area, and then um, connecting uh, to the real internal data draft analysis um, that answers to those questions, as well as then to discuss with the machine um, and, and get charts and graphs generated that, that then support the analysis. And um, a common feedback, I think this came um, also last year in the, in the BIS, um, uh, subtech survey that quite often uh, the supervisors feel that uh, the subtech solutions we have available at the moment they um, are somehow disjointed or, or detached from the workflow of the supervisors and um, and I have gotten this feedback I might create a great dashboard or tool which I think is useful but then the supervisor feels that I already have so many things I need to take off and so many dashboards I need to visit, so many tools I have to use and fill in information or analyze information on. And uh, now you're giving me another one. Um, the key to me seems to be that in order to integrate subtech to the workflow of the supervisors and really make the supervisors feel that they are helped by the system so rather than uh, uh, created additional pain with is the co-pilot uh, concept which of course Microsoft has chosen as well as the as the term um, they describe all the LLM based um, uh, solutions with and um, that's why the Saudi example was quite important because it gave a glimpse of that future where essentially um, you are going through your daily workflow and tasks as supervisor and next to you is an analyst or an assistant who is quite knowledgeable about the domain of supervision uh, uh, as well and who is completely um, uh, who never gets tired and who's always ready to keep on drafting the document keep on honing the craft better and better based on your based on your uh, discussion with it um, so I think this really is the future um, for the subtech tools or any actually any knowledge work I think will be totally changed now with this natural language interface and the co-pilots or assistants out there. Thanks a lot Petro that's uh, that's a great image to have. Um, I could also use one of those robot assistants to be honest. Uh, so Matt uh, let me ask you the same question which uh, solutions or a presentation stood out to you at, at Subtech Week. Yeah, um, I, I had actually um, yeah, Sama, the Saudi Central Bank, on, on my list. 
um, as one of the exciting points as well. I think like it's the beginning of, of a larger movement and to see concretely somebody interacting through natural language interfaces to create visualizations, you know, not to do the typical content lookup in a, in a uh, corpus of documents, but actually to generate quantitative charts based on underlying data as a proof of concept was uh, visually and, and intellectually like incredibly powerful to see. Um, I, I think it'll be really interesting to understand how that evolves from proof of concept to production and, you know, has the appropriate guardrails and, and testing and whatnot in place. And, and I'm sure that's their next step as well in, in, in going beyond that, that demonstration. Um, to Pertu's point on, on kind of integrating solutions with the supervisory value proposition, I think honestly, and I'm trying to take my bias out of this, um, but, but some of the more exciting presentations during the, the week for me were um, the launch pad, the SupTech launch pad presentation. So, of course, this included um, FNA's work with SBS in Peru, um, demonstrating an advanced analytics platform for social media monitoring to, to foster uh, consumer protection and, and market conduct supervision um, through topic analysis and trend analysis. Um, it included uh, Proto's complaints management platform, which has been you know, scaling globally um, since 2016 when we worked with them under the, the RegTech for Regulators Accelerator program. It's gone from a multilingual chatbot to a more full complaints management and analytics suite. Um, and Winnow Technologies, which is a, a relatively new vendor in the space, um, who's doing uh, web-based monitoring of app store reviews and social media and websites um, to bring non-traditional channels into the market conduct supervision space. So those as independent demonstrations were really interesting, but I think what, what struck me the most is how uh, how much these three solutions and, and providers um, integrated with each other or had conversations about how these solutions can stack together to create really not just single use case like end to end solutions, but actually address a suite of dispute resolution and, and market conduct supervision use cases um, together as, as, you know, kind of one holistic stack, um, of course, with each of their specializations and, and whatnot inside of that. But from a supervisory point of view, that that uh, felt incredibly powerful to see. Um, and then beyond the solutions, I think some of the really interesting conversations for me was about not just the intended consequences and the value propositions that are out there, but considering uh, beyond that, what are these tech solutions doing um, in terms of distribution of power or, uh, you know, things like uh, the ethics that go into this, the algorithmic fairness uh, conversations that happen around soup tech solutions, things like data protection, um, how we can better use sex and gender disaggregated data. Like these are not soup tech solutions or demonstrations per se, but they're kind of horizontal cross cutting themes that um, we're really excited, uh, really exciting to see as part of a more holistic conversation um, revolving around soup tech. So we get the flashy, amazing, fun things, but then we're having the serious conversations about how do we do this as a community responsibly? How do we make sure this isn't exacerbating, um, you know, competitive or or other gaps in the marketplace as we're doing this as well. So, um, yeah, really just a, an overall uh, amazing event. And, and shout out to our content partners, um, BIS Innovation Hub and, and World Economic Forum for really um, making this a huge success and, and something that we're looking forward to in 2024 already. Thanks a lot, Matt. So um, let me go back to you, Pertu, and ask... Uh, you talked a lot about large language models, right? And the, the whole concept, the co-pilot concept. How would you envision those specific solutions helping to enhance the oversight and compliance objectives at, for instance, the Qatar Central Bank? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, f first of all, I need to also um, <clears throat> take a step back to to, to some uh, a little bit more mundane um, or, or more <laughs> common topic which is data standards um before we we while we deploy llms and while while we deploy and develop new kind of uh, tools using them um one of the most important um uh, initiatives is and remains uh to be promoting data standards and as close to the source as possible um and this is something where the benefit for both industry and the regulators globally uh, can be huge. 
and I think the the regulatory community needs to continue um, uh, as a in in a role of of, of coordinator and uh, initiator and, and and getting things moving, and then um, potentially also some level of um, oblig on 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 the industry side is also required for for to implement this but the thing is that um, um, the the growth in the volume of information um, available for for supervisory um, oversight is just unprecedented and uh, despite of all the efforts in um, standardizing data and making it more structured um for everyone it would seem to be inevitable that um the 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 share of data that is following a schema that we can't control will still just grow which means that we just have to become better in somehow making sense out of the mess so a fuzzier way of um of 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 using uh, organizing insight and using it and um one in interesting aspect of llms is that um they have also um proven to be very good at uh, uh, extracting entities from structured data another use case where they are actually um better than than the earlier uh, methods generally so you can you can give an article news article or any report to an llm and ask it to um, extract the institutions the individuals the concepts from it and the relationships the document um, uh, claims there are in between them um, and this one then you can you can at least provisionally turn into a graph and uh, try to match with what you know, uh, what, what you knew before. So the LLMs can be um, hugely um, uh, useful already in, in, in just organizing that less uh, standardized, less uh, coordinated data that is all the time flowing past us with ever increasing speed. Um, and then once um, we have um, this um, knowledge in a stored in a more structured format, then again, uh, as we said before, we can then use LLMs on top of um, that knowledge graph or that knowledge base to uh, provide relevant answers uh, to supervisory questions uh, from that data. Um, so that is that is a key key um, area we are working on at the moment to to just to become better at analyzing organizing and analyzing everything relevant that floats past us and reducing the reliance on humans just scanning through or luckily being there when an important uh, piece of information flies past them um, but trying to be more systematic about it and connecting it to uh, those things that matter to us. That makes sense, yeah. So the LLMs have multi-purposes, right? At the extraction level, extracting the data, and also at the analysis level, and perhaps even Absolutely. further up the, the, the stack. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Berto. Um, I think I'm going to go to the next question and, and pose that to you, Matt. So we, uh, we're supposed to talk a bit about integrating RegTech and, and SubTech. Um, so what do you think are the benefits of integrating those architectures uh, for commercial banks on the one hand, or maybe more broadly the regulated entities, uh, and then on for supervisors on the other hand? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been saying for, I, I guess, ever since SupTech became a, a, an official term in this world, um, really the, the difference between SupTech and RegTech to me is which way you're facing when you stand at the private and public sector divide, right? Like. They're almost identical technologies. They're almost identical rationale. I, I see reg tech is kind of maybe a compression algorithm pulling from like raw data sources on the private sector side, getting it ready and shipping it over. And then somehow soup tech is like a decompression algorithm that turns it into intelligence on the other end of this pipeline. Um, so to me, um, 
there's a lot of work done on the private sector side to get this information ready. And sometimes that's manual, sometimes it's done through reg tech. Um, and on the other end, this decompression phase, there's a lot of work done to munge that data that's coming in, even if it's structured as Pratu is saying, even if it's structured or somehow processed by a, a natural language processing or other advanced processing technology to make it structured or make it intuitive for humans, there's still a lot of work to be done to turn that, combine it with other intelligence sources to turn it into something actionable, you know, an enforcement action or um, uh, statistics to inform policy or, or, or new regulation. Um, so I think, yeah, the main point here is is to borrow a term from uh, Miguel Diaz from the BIS Innovation Hub in Toronto. It's the le it's the least sexy stuff. It's the core, fundamental, like boring stuff, as he says, that is like. How do we make sure this information is standardized and there's an agree, agreed upon standard between these two parties? That answer has been around for, I don't know, 60 years, an application programming interface, right? Like, this is the way you codify standards into technology. And we've seen over and over that when this is adopted in a way that takes into account the private sector needs, uh, it saves time for supervisors, it creates more insights for supervisors, it saves money. Um, on the private sector side that is, you know, compliance costs and things like this that can then be spent improving other areas of, of compliance or reporting that might be more challenging to work on. It can be reinvested into financial inclusion initiatives, into more innovative and suitable products for end users um, and, and the like. So, yeah, I, I have yet to see a soup tech solution that we've worked on that doesn't involve a counterparty on the private sector side, or, or at least a financial citizen in the case of, um, you know, chatbots, and, and these need to be accounted for as part of the design process in, um, in the soup tech kind of uh, product life cycle. Thanks a lot, Matt. So let me put the same question to you, pair. So where do you see the relationship between rec tech and soup tech? Yeah, I, I think I could continue on what I said, and basically, basically this relates to what Matt said as well, is that um, those underpinning standards in data benefit everyone. So that should be the first first thing to do. Um, we know that um, sort of traditionally, um, regulatory data looked very different from the data the organization would want to look uh, by itself for operational purposes, and therefore, within the firms, it was not definitely probably not the sexiest thing to be the one who is responsible for filling the regulatory templates. But with uh, regulators wanting to uh, get more and more granular data um, over time, and this data then by definition becoming closer and closer of the operational um, kind of data with operational kind of definitions, um, the relative sexiness of this area within the firms should uh, improve. And, um, and and the supervisors should then also be able to see something that is closer to the narrative of the internal narrative of the of the firms, um, and definitely when 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 or by definition when when the underpinning data standards are the same, then it's much easier to build and share standardized components. Um, and the data um, messaging standard uh, is, of course, one key part, as Matt said as well, the API interface um, in, in creating those synergies. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think the more we have similar bases for the data, um, the, 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 the better this process will become for everyone. It all comes back to the data. In the yeah. End. yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot, both. Uh, so let's maybe skip to um, to a slightly different topic. So um, there is a lot of focus always on on systemic risk, um, and uh, soup takes place in, in in monitoring systemic risk is, is always a bit a bit tricky, uh, as opposed to more traditional sort of banking supervision and micro prudential objectives. Um, so let me start by asking you, Matt, uh, how do you think soup tech could help uh, financial authorities such as central banks? Uh, monitor systemic risk in in uh, in financial networks. Yeah, I mean, I think like some of the traditional network modeling techniques are are extremely useful and are already being um, brought to the the soup tech market in terms of solutions. Things like contagion modeling, understanding how actors fit together and how a disruption in one node of this network can propagate throughout and create risk across it. Um, you know, identifying key actors through cent centrality measures, things like this. You know, for not only systemically important banks, but also 
um, in networks of individual actors or, or private sector actors, um, you know, or bad actor networks and things like this for, for finding sources of fraud. Um, increasingly, so we're, we're building uh, a, a data gymnasium that is a platform for financial authorities to come on to and play around with um, various uh, advanced data science techniques and get their hands dirty with it, test it out, um, work with partners on it to understand, you know, how, how exactly do we want to tune this model and whatnot. And as part of that, we offered a, uh, an anti-money laundering network analysis module. Um, and so this is something that uh, I'm seeing increasingly developing uh, relatively quickly, which is kind of anti-money laundering moving from primarily a rules-based compliance system to something that's more directly incorporating advanced techniques like um, network analysis and, and graph neural networks and things like this to, to begin to more proactively predict um, areas where uh, money laundering might be happening based on behavioral indicators rather than um, you know, fixed rules and things like this. So this is an area where, for instance, um, IBM and MIT have had a longstanding uh, collaboration in, in working on some of this. And um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, the future of kind of co coordination and collaboration across anti-money laundering initiatives. Um, and then, of course, I think like um, without being biased toward the host hosting organization here for this podcast here today, of course, like uh, FNA's work in in modeling all of these topics has been um, substantive and and really pushing the envelope in terms of the soup tech space as well. Um, so that's been yeah wonderful to see that uh, continue to be injected in in new areas as well as growing in the the more traditional network analysis areas. Well, thanks a lot, Matt. And I won't comment too much on that either. But of course, uh, that is that is our uh, main focus. Um, so let me let me put the same question to you, uh, Pertu. What what do you have to say on the topic of systemic risk and soup tech? Mm. <clears throat> well, I, as, as I al already alluded, um, the uh, the importance of knowledge crafts uh, in in organizing unstructured or any knowledge or any information going forward. I do strongly believe that networks will be a key form for storing. Um, data, but also processing, modeling, analyzing the data going forward, and the importance will only grow um, over time. Um, and this covers any domain where the context, interconnections, second order effects, these sort of things are important. And financial system, of course, is a prime example of uh, all this. Um, yeah, FNA is definitely a pioneer. Um, you guys have been around for a long time to uh, develop these techniques and, and the tools. And um, uh, I, I'm sure this, this domain will stay really relevant and growing um, over the years now that the data sets hopefully are um, becoming more and more available that enable um, such analysis. Um, I, I do hope that uh, in areas like Matt um, mentioned as well, AML is one of those areas where essentially you can't really do your job properly unless it's a global initiative somehow. Um, and um, for that to be possible, of course, then there needs to be um, privacy preserving and business secret preserving techniques so that um, the relevant authorities can analyze what is what is important, but then also uh, everyone is um, happy to uh, collaborate in sharing this data. But, but yeah, definitely, I think the future is, is of uh, networks. Thanks, Petru. Yeah, that actually brings us a bit to the next question. So when we talk about collaboration across borders, uh, we've seen initiatives like uh, DORA and the AML package in the EU uh, trying to enhance uh, supervisory coherence. So how do you think uh, SoupTech and RegTech tools could play a role in, in enhancing this harmonization across borders? Uh, let me ask you first, Matt. Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, I think there's some really interesting com uh, trends coming up in their their early stages that I think could be truly transformative for for this space. Um, so for decades, we've we've been working on a model that requires data to be sent up to a financial authority, processed, stored, analyzed, and then presented, and all of that has to be the data moving into a central place, um, and then validated, you know, through on-site audits, et cetera, to make sure that that information is is accurate and up to date. Um, and that's that's worked. Um, it introduces risks, as Perto was alluding to, of 
uh, making sure that that data is secure, that it's under you know data governance standards, that it's retained only as long as it's needed to be, that that kind of stuff. Um, but now we're we're beginning to see models that have been theoretical for a long time um, coming into fruition. So a couple of those models are are like for instance data commons, which are you know a place where there's an exchange of value to create a central store of intelligence. Um, this is particularly interesting for things like uh, anonymized complaint centralization or um, yeah, various kind of uh, uh, credit information can be kind of centralized in this way and have exchanges of value where a private sector player might put information into this um, central data commons and receive some intelligence back in return. Um, and in the meantime, the supervisor can receive some of this. This still has a lot of the, the risks of centralization that would exist within the financial authority. Um, I think to me, really, uh, one very exciting model that I'm beginning to see um, come up more is um, the application of federated learning models, which is rather than bringing data all the way up into a centralized place and having it all together in one place, like actually sending algorithms down to meet the data where it is, processing it, getting it in the format that you need, and sending the intelligence up. Um, so it's somehow analogous to sending instead of a, well, in addition to a, a human um, examiner out to do an on site audit. You can send, you know, algorithmic model out to do a, a data a gathering and intelligence processing component um, and bring that back up. And um, all of this is is being complemented with kind of um, concepts like differential privacy measures, which ensure that, like, as you're collecting large amounts of intelligence or data, that there's no way to kind of back out sensitive information from this. Um, so there's there's yeah there's a competition that was recently won by a, a research group out of uh, Rutgers University, which is just up the road from where I live, um, that really focused on uh, federated learning models for money laundering detection. Um, so I think this will be really critical for topics like AML. That, as Pertu was mentioning, they they kind of require cross border collaboration in order to not leave arbitrage opportunities um, in place or, or you know pathways for money laundering to happen. Um, but that's currently, you know, hampered by important data sovereignty constraints. Like we can't share our data outside of this country because we have laws that say that we can't do this. So if we can begin to leverage some of these federated learning models and federated um, data processing uh, mechanisms, I think to me that's one of the most exciting developments that's out there right now. Well, that sounds like a very clever solution to to the confidentiality problem. Definitely, yeah. Uh, so, Perto, let me ask you the same question. So, so where do you see uh, rec tech and sub tech tools in the sphere of cross border collaboration? And maybe do you have any sort of specific examples from the Middle East? Well, uh, that's the, what Matt just said. Um, that really is promising and, and, and brings me new hope as well that, um, that we can start doing things collaboratively um, uh, without sharing things we can't or don't want to share um but still we can't uh, we, we still are, are stuck with the same fact which is that the data needs to be standardized um in the fir first instance so we need to have the definitions the data schemas they need to be standardized and um and um what eu has done here uh in these two areas um dora and uh, the aml package is uh, uh, one good example or two good examples of um, of that hard work of standardization to potentially really paying dividend in the end that and it is work that is not easy to start it's not it's not the most exciting thing and there's a lot of work to do um, but um, I think the EU has has been quite successful in in few cases in in creating standards that then become adopted um, more or less um, far um, out of the EU area, um, which which again speaks to the importance of the and the and the benefits um, from from just having the will to make that decision to get things standardized. Uh, it will mostly most often then benefit all the all the participants. Um, I can't now recall any. Um, um, examples of from here, but um, but for instance, in the in the privacy area, GDPR was heavily 
uh, impacting the, the, the data protection uh, um, uh, uh, legislation at our end as well, which is another example of the EU power in uh, in uh, putting that investment into into development of standards and then um, others benefiting uh, from um, adopting adopting them but then of course EU benefiting from from that standard standardization outside of it as well no well, thanks a lot Pertu. I think uh, yeah it's, I put you on the spot in, in terms of existing initiative in the Middle East of course that's that's tricky right but maybe like if you could look ahead and and think like is there do you see do you see a space for soup chicken in, in in collaborating with other countries i mean on the technical level and so it but it still depends on the data you say but do you see also specific tools that could potentially be used across uh, across the different uh, authorities in the middle east yeah definitely well uh, i don't really know if there's whether we need to sort of set any boundaries or or, or speak about specific groups of uh, regions or countries. I think in, in, in general, um, we all are in the same boat and we mostly talk about similar things. We have the same concepts and we have the same uh, challenges and the same things we have to do. And um, I am, in general, I am more and more hopeful that um, the future will be more open, more standardized, more sort of crowdsourced, more modular, in, in which everyone um, can contribute um, to building something, a common good that is much bigger than the, the sum of the efforts. Mm. Thanks a lot. Uh, so another big point here, of course, is skills, right? So to build subtech solutions, to use subtech solutions on the public sector side, and, and the same is true for RegTech on the, on the private sector side, uh, it's very important to get the right professionals and uh, get the right uh, people. So what what skills do you find are particularly critical when you have to integrate uh, RegTech and SubTech tools? Uh, and how do you think gaps can be addressed? And I, let me ask that question to you, Matt, first. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, first, I really want to underscore for this point that um, we work with a completely global set of, uh, of financial authorities and, and are deeply integrated with this community that we're a part of. And I, I just want to, um, yeah, underscore this point that many of the challenges are very similar, um, regardless of region. And, and this is really important. And this includes capacity building and education and training and upskilling and these kind of things, uh, which is the topic of this question. So from our perspective, um, there are like a set of skills that can be then tailored to the particular context where they need to be. And these skills are really kind of twofold, I guess, like there's kind of diagnostic skills and then there's like solution design and development skills. Um, and we offer a, a suite of courses at the, at the Cambridge soup tech lab and generally at the center for alternative finance, um, that train on these skills. So, um, important to mention, I think that, that this is something that we're doing as well, but. Um, I think number one is really in terms of diagnostic, like having a strong foundation on how digitalization of the private sector is creating new and newly magnified risks and what the resulting paradigm shifts in financial supervision look like and how those soup tech tools can be applied against those value propositions, not in isolation, just to say we adopted a tool because it's cool. And, the, you know, the term is hype right now and we want to be a part of that conversation. Like. That's a, that's a decent reason to try something out and run an experiment, but at the end of the day, it doesn't guarantee value. So understanding what the real risks are in the market and what the real needs of supervisors are is a non-technical skill, I would say, but fundamentally important. Um, and then applying that to one's own agency. So understanding within my jurisdiction, how do those risks manifest? Are they present in my area right now or will they be coming? And how do I develop uh, a supervisory strategy, but also like a soup tech strategy and roadmap um, that go along with that. So we provide a, a digital public good. It's free for financial authorities. Um, that's called the digital soup tech diagnostic tool that guides through a co pretty comprehensive um, set of questions that results in a report that helps to apply those market risks against uh, an agency's own context to begin to prioritize which areas might be most susceptible to soup tech. 
so beyond those kind of level setting and, and foundational pieces, um, the solution design and development I was mentioning is really, I think, threefold. Um, first, getting familiar hands on with tech and data science underlying soup tech solutions. Um, so this is important, not just for the IT departments and the techies, but also for supervisors who need to be able to express to solution providers, whether internal or external, what their needs are and to use a common language. Um, so really getting familiar with these tech and data science tools underlying this. I mentioned our practical data science program and our data gymnasium uh, at the lab. Um, and then understanding design thinking frameworks like uh, value proposition, value proposition, value proposition analysis, lean product design, um, agile development, change management, of course, is a big one. Um, and then getting to the prototyping and iterative development. So for me, um, you might note that I didn't really touch on any deep technical, you know, traditional, like computer programming skills, other than mentioning familiarity with data science. I think to me, so much of this is about having a common language and a common vision and setting a scope up that allows people to then express themselves into this. So you can find a vendor that will give you a solution. You can find potentially an IT department or a data science unit or a specialist within your organization that can build the solution you want, but they'll have no idea what to do unless you can express it. And you'll have no idea how to like do user acceptance testing and understand whether this is actually doing what it says. Um, if you're not tying that back to some underlying value proposition. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, these are, these are skills that can be taught and learned, and I don't think they require replacement of individuals or, um, you know, augmenting a team necessarily. Um, but, but most of these can be really brought into existing supervisory units and, and teams to, to really augment it. Um, the last thing I want to mention is in the 7 or 8 years that I've been working in this, um. Tech for public sector, you know, soup tech space, um. Though it wasn't always called that there's been a, a growth of financial authorities capacity. To and, and desire to build things themselves. Um, 7 or 8 years ago, you know, I was hearing like, yeah, we'd love to have that, but we have no idea how to do that. We're going to buy it from somebody. Um, now, there's more of a, a deeper integration, even for solutions that are being bought to say, well, we want to understand a little bit more about how to customize this when we need to do it. Um, or we want to work with a solution provider who, at the end of the day, you know, is, is developing an API around this data standard, but we want to own that at the end of the day. And the solution provider can go and resell that elsewhere, but we want this thing in house. Um, and that's something that is, I think, a trend that that will continue in some regards, particularly for areas that are more infrastructure level and less um, maintenance intensive. So, yeah, I, I think these are the the skills that are are necessary to 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 build and maintain soup tech solutions that are relevant and valuable. Well, I'm glad to hear that there is still some work to be done by uh, by the vendors, uh, <laughs> even if it's API focused. Um, <laughs> Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, so, Peter, let me ask you the same question. Skills, what do you find are essential skills and, and how do we address mm. gaps? Many, many good points in, in what Matt said, uh, just said. And uh, one thing I could, would like to start with is the design thinking. And this goes back to the integrating the tools to the supervisory workflow that we really need to understand the these uh, the, the people and what they want to do um, in order to design them something. It, it needs to be something that feels ideally it feels like an extension to of them and 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 kind of uh, complements them in their in their supervisory tasks rather than something um, that they need to um, start using by reading a, a, a long manual or, or uh, instructions that that more follow our train of thought or the system's internal logic than than how they naturally want to do things. Um, but then, in more more general, I think one key thing is, of course, on the um, because we are talking about change here. We are talking about something that is rapidly changing, and when things are rapidly changing, people need to adapt. And um, in that, um, having a common accept, acceptance and understanding of where we are heading and then on building on that trust that the different areas, whether they are supervisors, subtech people or IT developers or, or vendors, that they all can work um, um, without playing games but rather feeling that they are just contributing to the same thing and they have a roughly 
shared understanding of what, what they are aiming to to do and then within that like matt said as well um i wouldn't probably go to single out any uh, individual skills especially to say which skills are more important than others because subtech uh, so data science itself um uh, it's uh, like for a long time has been said that these people are, are like unicorns because you need to know maths and statistics and you need to know the domain you need to know it you need to know uh data visualization and um in general not all these skills live in the same head ever um and um therefore you need to have complementary skills across within these teams and across these teams and um but when you have that trust in place, um, thing, the, the pieces start falling falling to places and, and you can start producing something together. We definitely started from a place where sort of the very old fashioned uh, suspicions were in place. Uh, the IT asking, but we are the ones developing applications and now you are telling us that you are starting to develop applications. And um, it was quite uh, sort of frosty at start um but then we we got to a place where we we the the understanding became more shared and now there is that trust and i don't think we are we are spending any energy anymore in 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 thinking that um the uh, the counterpart has somehow a different agenda um and and, and therefore therefore um spend time in in unproductive on unproductive things um then with regards to vendors, um, I do think that um, it's always when you when you buy something, it is quite important that you understand what you are buying. And um, that's why um, I think the supervisory authorities have been um, quite wise that they don't just go and buy something. Um, but first of all, they need to experiment and find the things that work and understand how they work. And um, I think then that's the time to um, start engaging vendors because vendors will then have there's going to be extra skills uh, again new people new flavor in that group um, new um, abilities um, and then just simply extra hands and um, and 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 then you can um, you can very fruitfully I think um, um, build projects or develop uh, project teams, including uh, both internal and external people um, to, to, to create something that that's, uh, w w works and um, helps the supervisors. So yeah, I think uh, along the same lines with uh, Matt, that it is, um, we I think we lost your audio, uh, Petro. Yeah, just cut, I think. Yeah. I think he's trying to unmute and mute himself. Okay, well, um, we we received most of that. It was only at the very end you cut off. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I probably then uh, was able to convey everything I, I wanted. Thanks a lot. So we can hear you again now. So that, that's perfect. Uh, um, yes, I can only echo from the vendor perspective that that we also appreciate working with the supervisors on on proof of value or proof of concept projects to get, gain an understanding from the institution on what is needed. And, and and that's usually where we get the most fruitful outcome is where we understand from the tech point of view what the uh, what the user point of view is, uh, and we're able to kind of bring those two parts together, uh, which is always tricky. It's always tricky stuff. Uh, okay, well, th well, thanks so much both. Uh, I think um, I will go ahead and, and uh, open up t for questions from the audience. Um, so let me see here. Um, I have one here that asks, um, for financial authorities with limited resources, what feasible steps can they take today to start benefiting from SubTech innovations uh, showcased at the SubTech Week? So let me start with you, Matt. What do you think? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So I think, um, I mean, really number one in my mind is noting that soup tech is not like a step change. It's not like something that you just don't have today and then you have it tomorrow. Like it's, it's, and it's also not just like a portmanteau of supervisory technology. It's actually a process. So, um, 
it's something that you can work toward in a non-monolithic way. You can take bite-sized chunks that create the most immediate value and then build from there. So in a resource constrained environment, um, you know, that, that warrants, I think, like increased attention to prioritization. What piece can I bite off first that's going to create immediate value, save me time. And then with that time savings, I can reinvest some of that into another initiative and, and kind of keep building momentum up that way. In terms of the progression, often what we see is that this starts with kind of like, like I mentioned earlier, less sexy, like yeah, data standards, um, like, like Pertu mentioned, and then collection and processing that, that ensure that data is um, held accountable to those standards. Um, and that he, that has huge implications for time and cost savings. Like we've heard uh, just last week, we were with a financial authority who said a compliance report used to take an individual one hour to go through all of the cells of a, of a spreadsheet and validate that. And now they click a button and it does that in one second. So that means a week's worth of work is now down to like one minute worth of work. And that means that that supervisor can do the job that they were hired to do, which is consider like the implications of the intelligence coming out of this, consider um, additional innovations that might happen on top of that. And that can be, as I mentioned earlier, reinvested. And in turn, these this time savings kind of unlocks more advanced analytics, um, room for experiments with vendors who are doing things that aren't in-house capacity, and then a, a deeper understanding of like, what do you want to bring in-house? You know, like what is a core supervisory function? And what is something that you want to work with a vendor on because either they're extremely ad advanced in one area like like network analytics or they're working on a problem that requires a high level of maintenance like language modeling that's continuously updated or um, social media monitoring which is constantly changing every day um, so these are areas where yeah you can then invest um, i think from the lab's perspective our mission is to democratize like access and uh, to the value produced by soup tech and make sure that um, you know, fair and equitable financial systems are, are developed worldwide. And so we, we produce, um, courses that, uh, are available to and applicable to, to kind of all, um, spectrum of, of economic, uh, levels for, for countries. Um, and we often work with sponsors to make sure that, um, participants from organizations who may not have capacity building budget can still have access to our courses can still work through the innovation and, and scoping exercises that are part of our courses and take those principles back home to make sure that they, they are building some of these um, capacities up. Uh, finally, yeah, we, we also work with um, sponsors to understand which are areas of prioritized um, prototypes in terms of soup tech solutions and uh, often can get sponsorships for, for working on this work. Uh, and the very last point is everything that we do, wherever we can, we're putting out there uh, for free. So this year we're going to be launching an open data repository, an open code repository. We have a solutions tracker, a vendor database, all of these tools that give intelligence um, to uh, our, our community of supervisory experts and um, soup tech aficionados who want to understand what else has been done and not have to reinvest in the lessons that have been learned by others. Um, so, yeah, those, those components together, I think, can, can help get started. And I'm, I'm happy to field uh, direct questions outside of this um, panel as well. It's important thing to note for everyone listening that uh, that's an opportunity. Uh, I don't know, Pertu, do you want to add anything here? Any, any, um, anything that, that with limited resources, one should focus on? Yeah. So. We spoke about data standards a lot, but the reality is that um, the data uh, sets we use historically are very different across organizations. The the processes can be quite different. So we, we said that we share the similar sort of pain, but in terms of specific subtech solutions, every organization still has very uh, unique set of uh, problems. And um, therefore, at the moment, um, it's, it, it can be also somewhat limited uh, how much we can benefit from, let's say, sharing the source code of tools because they just you just can't plug it into your data or it doesn't fit your processes uh, as a super regulatory authority. Um, this will probably change over time, but, um, but this is where we start from. And like we said, um, this is very much, um, the, the, the people are different as well. So organizations are different and people are different. So I think how small organization can start is to have someone at least who 
um, is um, has the uh, has understanding of the domain is maybe a supervisor um, and and then has technical skills to to start learning and exploring how um, what could be done to the current processes and then just choose something that is um, um, sufficiently important and what is also feasible to to uh, implement and and start exploring and and demonstrating and and developing the first prototype and then potentially moving it to production and showing everyone that what is possible and this will start then elevating the the organizational level of understanding the of the art of possible and then you can hire another person and and deliver more and, and so forth um so i think um that is that is how it, it needs to be started but like matt uh, said as well there's very useful um, networks also available so i would highlight highlight the bis information uh, bis informal subtech uh, network is one uh, great place to share views and ideas and and, and uh, work um, the Cambridge uh, Subtech Lab, of, if of course, uh, and the Subtech Week um, is now uh, another great um, place to to um, coordinate, uh, collaborate with people. And then the FNA, uh, the Subtech um, uh, sessions. Also, I have I have um, found out about people I I never knew before. Uh, just watching these uh, sessions and uh, then reached out and made new new very very fruitful connections so all these um, three are definitely also good places to to build that thinking and and and, and help to to build those first use cases thanks if, if just, yeah please, if I please. Quickly add one one more um, the BIS uh, Irving Fisher committee and their annual data science and central banking conference and the the report that comes along with that is another very rich source of information for soup tech solutions particularly as it relates to you know prudential and and um, core kind of central banking uh, pieces but also the technologies are generally often agnostic to uh, to the use case so that that's another one I would add as a fourth to, to purchase list yeah no, thanks a lot, both. I think, and it's good for the audience to know that they've already checked one of those, right? They're already viewing an FNA broadcast as we speak, yeah. so that's good. Um, we're actually close to the uh, to the to the limit here, but I just want to ask one final question to you, Pedro. So, also from an, from the audience member, um, you talked about guardrails uh, and frameworks in place to ensure that LLMs are used responsibly. Do you have any uh, sort of example of maybe one of the most important parts of that? Um. So something we are building, we are we're developing a prototype where we use uh, LLM to um, perform compliance analysis, and um, it's very important that um, such a process keeps the human in the loop, um, the supervisor uh, being the ultimate uh, ultimate uh, decision maker, and we need to design those tools in such a way that the supervisors could would would keep their sort of feet on the ground <laughs> that they they really they are helped by the analysis but they they are they will keep their heads cool uh, while uh, doing that um something happened again um the um with doing their decisions so uh, uh i think that's that's the most important thing that um it is an assistant but as, as a human assistant if you have a junior uh, school leaver or, or fresh uh, person from university providing you analytical assistance, you will be very careful before you just um, go and copy and paste their uh, suggestions to to your uh, actual pro proposal to your boss. So um, this is how we need to treat uh, any kind of co-pilot or assistant. Thanks, Lopez. So that's a good good point to end on, uh, keeping the human decision making at the end. Um, well, thank you both, Petro and Matt, for participating today. It was very interesting to hear your insights uh, into the topic of subtech. And uh, yeah, I hope we can re reconnect again at a future date uh, for a future broadcast. So before we end, let me just um, show you that uh, on the slide here that my colleague has shared, um, we're having another broadcast on CBDC uh, in uh, about a week's time. Um, and then again, we have another payment systems broadcast uh, towards the end of February. Um, all that's left to do is to say thank you again and uh, see you next time. Thanks, thank everyone. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye bye. See you.